When you go to iFirm trainings, they are all looking to try to identify talent. It's, it's, it is, it's in their best interest to find people that things click with or that get a little spark and say, you know, this is making sense. Um, they're showing up on time, you know, they're they're asking the right questions. Absolutely. It's definitely a two way street. I mean, we're learning about you and, and you know, whether or not you really want to be there. Hey, this industry is not for everyone, but if it's for you, we want to make sure that we put you to work and that we keep you working. This is Adjuster TV. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Learn more at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. E &O provider Kaplik, download the free insurance for adjusters guide at cplic.net slash adjuster TV and by Crawford Catastrophe Services. Join Adjuster TV at the 2022 Crawford and Company CAT Conference the first week of March 2022 in Orlando. There are literally dozens of training classes, including wildfire, flood, and several carrier certifications, among others. Register for the conference right now for early bird pricing. Get full details at crawco.com slash cat and scroll down to the conference link. The full link is in the description where you're watching or listening to this program. Again, Adjuster TV will be attending this conference, so when you sign up, let them know we sent you. Hague Education, US Tape, and Eberl Claim Service. Apply now at eberls.com and let them know that Adjuster TV sent you. Hey, Matt here with Adjuster TV and for the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe now and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a video. And I'm here with Jeffrey Conrad, who is the director of training for Crawford and Company. And speaking of the first call list, Jeffrey, can you kind of like, I don't know, tell us if it's real and if it is real, like how would you get on the first, such a first call list? Absolutely. So, you know, first off, thank you for having me. And I'm, I love what you do uh, with Adjuster TV. You've always been a great advocate uh, for adjusters and, and kind of, you know, educating us and, and letting us know how to be successful in this industry. I think we both kind of share that passion. So I have a responsibility of making sure that we find, you know, talented individuals um, and that we train them up and that we make them available to all of our carriers. And there's a huge demand uh, for adjusters. Um, and so you know, we want to make sure that we identify adjusters that are good people. You know, Robert Simpson, our president, he's always saying the same thing. We want to find good people. And what I look for whenever I teach a training class is I look for individuals that have that care factor. You know, I want to know, do you really care? Do you really want to make sure that that claims experience for that customer is it going to be a good one? Because we can teach, you know, policy. We can teach you how to properly document a claim file and, and use an estimated program to pay the customer, you know, a lot of money. But great adjusters are the ones who actually care. They're not there just to make money. Making money is a huge bonus in this industry. But we want to make sure that we provide a great claims experience for our customers because that's really what's going to matter most uh, and it's going to keep that insured with that carrier for many more years to come because, you know, let's think about this, you know, insurance carriers, they all sell the promise, right? Yep. And as adjusters, we're there to deliver it. And if we don't do that one thing, then they, they go elsewhere. So to get on our list is invest in yourself. And we want to make sure that we give you that opportunity to invest in yourself, sharpen those skills, uh, learn the processes, get familiar with the carrier's uh, systems and sharpen those estimating tools. Uh, that's really what's going to get you uh, to work very quickly. And we want to build that relationship with you. So, you know, taking advantage of the opportunities that we provide is going to put you at the top of that list for those calls. So. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I say it all the time on here, you know, the first call list is real, you know, the, the, when, when I firms and carriers, I mean, carriers will say, Hey, you know, we need 25 people to go to St. Louis for a storm. And we would be, we'd love it if 10 of those people were on this year list, right? It's because these people have worked for us before we, you know, the carriers track those metrics, um, on the, the adjusters, just like the, the firms do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important to not only be able to do a, to be fast, to be able to turn claims over and get them closed and have good cycle time, but you gotta have 
you have to close a good claim, right? And you have to take care of the customer. So it's, it's my number one <laughs> um, kind of, you know, thing that I, I try to hammer home on everybody is you just got to be, you got to be fast, you got to be good, and you got to be friendly. I mean, it, it's just those three things. So tell us a little bit about Jeffrey Conrad. Like, where do you come from? What's your story? Sure. So I grew up in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, and I've always been fascinated uh, by hurricanes. And I remember as a young kid, you know, my, my dad didn't play around with hurricanes. Whenever you live in a bowl, you know, there was a, there could be a hurricane in the Caribbean and, and we're, we're packing up, we're getting out of there. Uh, he just didn't play around uh, with hurricanes. And I made the comment one day as we're packing up the car, I was like, I hope that hurricane comes here. And, and my dad just gave me this look of, why would you say such a horrible thing? And I was like, I just want to get off of school. And so uh, <laughs> when, I entered this, when I entered this industry and I told him what I was, what I was doing, he's like, that's fitting. You've always prayed for storms and you know, you've always wanted them to come here, but uh, it wasn't until I got my first experience with a true major catastrophe. Uh, I experienced Katrina very personally, just like a lot of folks in the Gulf Coast. Uh, sure. And at the time, you know, I was a branch manager of a financial office there in Gulfport, Mississippi, that was completely wiped out by Hurricane Katrina. And so, uh, like many folks on the Gulf Coast, kind of was out of a job. You know, technically, I still had a job, but I have a identical twin brother uh, who was living and working in New Orleans who completely lost his job. He evacuated to Texas and he got the dreaded phone call that uh, he no longer has a job. And uh, so he called me and says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in a bad place. I don't have a lot of money. I've evacuated my family. Do you know anybody that's hiring? And so I know there was an adjusting firm uh, in Mobile that was most likely hiring uh, since we just had this major event there. And so uh, I told him to send me his resume. And so I remember showing up to the HR department there and introducing myself as Christopher Conrad. So uh, in the interview, I did pretend to be my twin brother uh, <laughs> to get him the position. And so uh, I did come clean after I got the offer. I was like, hey, this resume is not mine and my name's not Chris. I said, but please hear me out. I said, that's my twin brother. I would do anything for him. And I said, he looks just like me, same personality. Um, and please let me know that he still has the job. And I think they were really desperate because uh, the offer was still his and yeah. like, hey, it's yours if you want it to. So uh, the rest is history. So uh, we worked together for about 15 years uh, working claims. Wow. So, nice. Yeah, and cool. so kind of, so you, so you did mostly catastrophe stuff. Yes. All pretty much catastrophe. So kind of started off, uh, you know, kind of thrown out there as an agent advocate, uh, ironically, just a few blocks from my finance office. Um, but that was a great intro for me into this industry because I dealt with the personal aspect of claims. I dealt and, and experienced so much emotions from customers that really had nothing to go back to. Um, so a lot of times, you know, I was the, the shoulder to cry on and, and just the, the reassurance that, hey, we're here to help and we're here to kind of put you back to pre-loss condition. And so when I, I migrated to that adjuster position, um, I just kept that same emotion um, and I treated every customer as if they were my only one and uh, just really excelled uh, as an adjuster and then very quickly made my way into that trainer position um, because, I mean, I, I, I was kind of thrown out there with very little support, very little training. And I just, just said, you know what? I'm going to make sure no one goes through what I went through. You sure. know, the, the sink or swim, the, you know, see if it sticks kind of mentality. Um, so I just fell in love with teaching and introducing this pretty cool industry to, to new folks. So definitely found my passion. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. And then, so then you, so how, how long did you, had you like run claims for Crawford before or did you like, how did that work? So I'm fairly new with Crawford. Um, so I was a, a trainer for about 15 years um, and then uh, left that IA firm and became a uh, manager uh, or training manager uh, for another firm there in Mobile. And then Crawford came knocking uh, at my door 
and uh, kind of interesting story. So Crawford had pretty much sent a mole to one of my training classes just to kind of feel me out. Really? And it was, yeah. So I thought it was kind of, kind of weird, but it was this young gentleman that uh, came into my class, uh, never touched exact meat before and, but very fast learner. And I identify talent. That's one of the things that I do in the class. Sure. If I'm, I'm paying attention to, you know, who's got the skills, who has the care factor, who's a fast learner. And so I remember day one after, you know, being in my class, I pulled him aside. I said, do you have your adjuster's license? And he's like, I do not. I said, you have all the skills and talent and personality to be amazing in this industry. And so I just kind of monitored him and just kind of coached him up. And I said, look, this is your next step. And um, ironically, he was the Crawford mole. <laughs> so I got, they called me out, you know, unsolicited and says, Hey, we would love for you to join us. Uh, we've got something amazing going on here. Uh, we'd like for you to be a part of it. So uh, really it was an opportunity. I really couldn't pass up. Um, my dream job uh, as so I get to, you know, create training uh, classes, material, yeah. really ensuring that each, even new adjusters, if they want to come on board, hey, we're going to give you all of the support and education that you need to really excel in this industry. So uh, that's what I'm working on. So. Very nice, very nice. And just as a note, and I'll, I'll say this to anybody who's watching and listening or listening to this, that when you go to I firm trainings, they are all looking to try to identify talent. It's, it's, it is, it's in their best interest to find people that things click with or that get a little spark and say, you know, this is making sense. Um, they're showing up on time. You know, they're, they're asking the right questions. Um, they're eager to learn. And this is something that as an industry that we need and, and, you know, t long story short, you know, to anybody out there who's like, well, you know, I'll just go show up to this thing and I can put on my resume and just, you know, glide through whatever. You're, 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 you're every, every touch at, at a firm or any, any other place that's associated with our business is a potential opportunity for you to get noticed and to get work. Want to work from home? I thought that might get your attention. I'll cut to the chase here and tell you that the IA firm Paysetter Claim Service frequently has work from home opportunities for the field and also for desk work, which let's be honest, really just means work at home in your PJs. Still wanna work in the field though? Paysetter's Evo platform is fully integrated with Hover. It is the best of the app-based claims handling systems out there right now. Technology is moving faster than ever and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. We put together a free guide to maximizing your productivity while working at home in your pajamas, along with a link to apply to this dynamic firm. And you can find both at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. Absolutely. It's definitely a two-way street. I mean, we're learning about you and you know whether or not you really want to be there, you're taking it seriously, but also we, we've got to sell ourselves. We've got to sell Crawford to you. We want, we want to make sure that we're a good fit for what you're looking for. You know, as you know, you know, this industry is very unique. You know, Mother Nature does her things. You know, she goes quiet sometimes. So there's going to be some scalability there. And we want to make sure that we set that expectation, you know, on the front end that, hey, this industry is not for everyone. But if it's for you, we want to make sure that we put you to work and that we keep you working. Um, and building that relationship uh, is very, very important. And it all starts with you know, attending those training classes, uh, because not only sure. are you learning, yeah. but you're, we're introducing our, our managers, our managers come into our classes. Uh, even uh, the president, Robert Simpson will uh, come in. I remember one of the classes I was teaching, uh, he had this cart and he, he rolled in warm chocolate chip cookies. Oh, boy. And it kind of, it kind of blew everyone's mind. I'm like, this is the president of cat services coming in to the classroom and providing everyone cookies. And it was pretty cool to see. And, you know, at that time I was still pretty new with Crawford, but that's the corporate culture that we have is that, you know, we want to make sure that we take care of our adjusters because they are our true, our greatest asset. Because if you think about it, we've got three customers as an IA firm. We've got our carrier that we need to take care of. Yep. Um, and we've got our adjuster and the insured. 
But what we found is if we truly invest in our adjusters, they take care of the other two. They take care of the insured, which ultimately makes the carrier happy. Um, so we've got a huge task in making sure that we provide a, uh, a great work environment, uh, work opportunities, and are always investing in our adjusters by properly training them and, and sharpening those skills throughout the entire year. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so you kind of talk a little bit about you know Crawford's sort of uh, corporate culture, but kind of give us a you know for those who don't who aren't familiar with Crawford, talk a little bit about you know the company as a whole and and your part in catastrophe. You know what kind of claims you know adjusters can expect to get their hands on, whether it's you know daily catastrophe, property auto, that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, so we're a very large company, uh, publicly traded. Uh, entity. We're in 70 different countries. Uh, we have over 9,000 employees um, and over 50,000 field resources. We'll talk about we go look a little bit later on, contractor connection. Um, so when I entered this industry, I always saw Crawford as, and this is just my perception, as the elite. You know, I need to work my way to get to Crawford. Sure. And, uh, but when I came on board, you know, our we're, yes, we're looking for those veteran adjusters, but we really want to tap into that those new adjusters and introduce them and and get them trained up because we've got you know a huge responsibility. I know when when Hurricane Ida hits, you know we've got a huge demand of you know adjusters, and even though we trained up just to date from January of this year, we trained up fourteen hundred adjusters, and these are folks that are just recently added to our roster, and we still did not meet our, our client requests. And that's something that we're working on. And, sure. and that comes with our investment and attraction uh, to get new adjusters on board. Um, and, and one of the things that we've done, uh, this, we've done it, this will be a third time doing it this year, is we have these, what we call adjuster roundups, where you know individuals that are looking to learn or even veteran adjusters to come in and learn about Crawford. Our, our, our president is there. Our, our, field res our field resource managers are there, HR is there. We're guiding them to get on, on our roster, and then we're giving them all the training that we need um, to, to sharpen those skills and be ready for deployment. And so we want to continue to give uh, adjusters those opportunities and build that relationship. We, you know, we want to make sure we see them and recognize them um, in their faces. And so it was kind of great to see that a lot of the faces that I saw in our training classes and our roundup events, I saw them when I was in Lafayette in Metairie, Louisiana, in those support rooms. And so they're like, God, you know, I remember you and it's, it's cool to see. And it's, it's all about relationship building. And uh, we want to make sure that the next event that we're your only choice for deployment, but uh, cause it's, it's a, it's a free for all whenever a big event hits and we just want to kind of build that world. <laughs> That's our goal. So. That's a fact for sure. So, and you kind of touched on it for a second, but you know, you, you guys, it, you have a lot of opportunities there, you know, even opportunities be way, it sounds like way beyond the scope of just insurance claims as for independent adjusters. Um, but you do have, you know, a lot as we kind of were, you know, this is, we're around Christmas time here. So it's, it's like this time of year, it's probably the slowest time I would say, generally speaking. Um, so adjusters are always looking for ways to, you know, kind of keep the lights on and keep the wolves away from the door um, or looking for ways to kind of get some sort of hands on practice with certain aspects of claims handling is scoping, for example, and, and Crawford, you guys, we go look is a Crawford outfit, right? Um, that's Maybe talk a little bit about We Go Look just briefly and kind of explain what it is to people. But yeah, so We Go Look um, is an, another way of making money um, whenever you're not on deployment. So all of that kind of comes into play whenever you uh, get on our roster. You know, we can see you, I guess, uh, like, on a, like a, on a map. And if we've got a carrier that's looking for any sort of uh, uh, property information, measurements or photos, uh, we can send you and utilize you as a resource to provide that data to our, our desk adjusters. So we're always trying to keep our folks working. Um, and that's another way of doing so is, uh, is the We'll Go Look uh, initiative. Are you interested in more than just punching a clock and paying the bills? 
Wouldn't you rather be on the A team surrounded by the best of the best in the industry? Then you need to check out Eberl Claim Service. For well over 30 years, Eberl's philosophy of treating adjusters as they wish to be treated has allowed them to establish a vast network of the most professional, educated, and dedicated adjusters in the industry. So at Eberl, you're in good company. If you're a motivated and compassionate adjuster slash claims professional, Eberl wants you to represent their organization. Go to jobs.eberls.com right now and get started with Eberl Claims Service. All right, so now let's let's kind of do a little bit of a deep dive on training. So as the director of training, like what are you guys working on for new folks, you know, like to, to get hands-on training maybe, um, or even experienced guys who want to maybe expand their, their sort of quiver of skills. You know, I, I just, I always like kind of look back and, and how I got my start. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I wasn't properly prepared. You know, I, I think after a big event, uh, a lot of, a lot of folks are just kind of thrown out there and just with the hopes that you, you figure it out. Um, but we hurt a lot of people when, when we do that yeah. and we try our best you know, not to send anyone out there that's not prepared. It doesn't know what they're doing. And like we mentioned earlier, you know, deployment is not the best time to learn. Um, and so we want to make sure that if, if you're on our roster, that you're ready, that you understand the importance of policy. And that's really where a lot of our classes start. And, you know, I always kind of joke that, you know, if you have trouble sleeping at night, break out an insurance policy, start reading it, and it'll definitely <laughs> put you to sleep because... No one wants to read that thing. Um, yeah. But I realized very quickly that I can't effectively do my job if I have no idea what that policy states. Yeah. You know, I've, I've heard adjusters showing up basically trying to deny, you know, I'm not paying for this. I can't pay for that. And I'm like, you have no idea what your role is here as an adjuster. You know, your job is to find ways to pay find coverage because as soon as that insured feels like you're out there to deny they're out there to kick you off their property you yeah, know and you just made your sure. job 10 times harder and so explaining the importance of policy and how we convey our role to the insured and the correlation of the policy and what i do is that i'm here to find ways to pay and if something's not covered i'm going to share you on the policy and the legal verbiage that the policy is defining this I'm not making this up. I'm not, I'm the one that's not deciding that something is or not covered, you know? And so we have to pay attention to how we talk to the customer. Mm -hmm. I can't pay for this. I can't pay for that. I was able to buy your roof. The word I, you need to take that word and punt it because you are yes. not making the, the pins, you know? And the customer, if you deny something because you said, I can't do that, you've now conveyed to them that this is now a negotiation. And they're going to wear you out and try to get you to change their mind or get you to change your mind. So that's a that's going to complicate your job and really get the entire claims experience tainted with um, a very negative uh, you know, yeah, atmosphere. For sure. Now for sure. Work against you. Yeah. So that's that's one of the things I I learned to say early on was, uh, unfortunately, the policy. Um, you know, excludes damage caused by this. And here's the particular policy language. I mean, you're an adjuster. I mean, it's, it's policy you're saying. So, so, so as far as policy, like understanding and training goes, like what kind of resources is, does this Crawford have, or how do you recommend people get, learn the policy? So if, first off, I always kind of, even for a veteran adjuster class, I always ask, Hey, who's, who's read a policy? And you'd be surprised how many adjusters that have been doing this for many years have never read it in its entirety. And I was like, you, you all have homework. But um, as far as the- If it's more than uh, zero, PG, I would be very surprised. And it's, it's very few hands that go up. And I'm like, Jeez. none of you can effectively do your job because the customer is not going to feel like you're there to find ways to pay. Um, but- what we do is we don't just in class just break out a policy and just start reading it verbiage, you know, line by line. That that will put everybody to sleep, right? Sure. So what we do is we kind of give scenarios and personal experiences that hey, I came up to this lost location. This is what I saw. Hey, you know what? I'm going to do my best to make sure that this is covered. Let's visit the verbiage here. Let's read it. 
this is what needs to happen in order for there to be coverage here. This is how we're going to address it. And, you know, we want to make sure that we support that coverage decision with all the evidence needed, your file documentation, your photographs, all that is needed to be in the file to support your findings. And a lot of times the adjusters don't really understand like why my file is getting kicked back, why my coverage decision is being denied. It's because look at your documentation, look at your photographs, they don't support your findings. And so whenever adjusters take the shortcut to rush to a claim, to close a bunch of claims today, well, they just made their job 10 times harder because nothing's getting improved because they didn't take the time to properly document or have sufficient photographs in the file. Uh, I've seen some photographs. I'm like, what is that thing? I don't even know what it is. So properly labeling your photos too. These are things that actually increase efficiency. And uh, you'll, you'll see that a lot of times your files are approved, you know, and that ultimately makes you a lot of money. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really just, let's read the verbiage here. Let's look at some damages. Hey, is this covered? If it's not, let's have that conversation. It's really very, you know, kind of makes sense, makes this, you know, legal verbiage more tangible to the, to the new student. Right. So. Right. So, so in essence, the way you guys teach it, teach it is to say, okay, well, let's, you probably have a, a, a brief introduction that says, well, here are the parts of the policy in the basic, you know, a few definitions and then how to let's apply this thing. Right. Cause I, I've been in training before for policy stuff, complex, like farm and ranch. Those, those can be complicated with every single thing being broken out and scheduled. And, and you know, the, the policy, they have different language, you know, the, the deck sheet might be, you know, six pages long instead of just like a paragraph. Um, and they would go, they went through all that stuff. And it's like, I had, I'd handled, this was like a, a class I had to attend, but I'd already handled farm ranch claims. I'm like, the easier way to do this is to take, just take an example. They got a, a house, right? And you have a machine shed, you got a dairy barn, you got some corn bins, you got a, you know, uh, grains, you got silos, and then you have another location, right? It's two miles away. Well, how do we, let's, let's, let's work on that under the constraints of the policy. So I think that that approach, I mean, it, it takes, insurance is boring. Let's just, I mean, <laughs> let's just be honest. Okay. But the thing about it is, is when you apply it to like a disaster situation, for me, it starts to get really, really, really interesting. And so when you can say, all right, well, you know, we're looking at these corn bins, here's a picture of a corn bin, or we're standing in front of a corn bin, um, you know, where is this on that deck sheet? What's the coverage? How do I code this in Xactimate? How do I, you know, so on and so forth. Then that makes it real. And it makes it, I think, a whole lot easier for people to have it stick. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, every time we visit something in the policy, we've got some sort of personal experience or, hey, I had a claim that, that looked like this. You would think this, but actually because of this, it, it was covered. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, given that, that real world uh, application and, and tying it into that really confusing legal verbiage uh, makes it more understandable, uh, you know, to to definitely a new student and also a veteran who's oh that's what that means, you know. Yeah, um, it, it's funny <laughs> that you brought up you know personal experience uh, and you know I've you know, I've been a teacher of, of claims, uh, an advocate of insureds for a long time. And you know, I was kind of taught my classes as if I really understood the insured perspective. You know, I've been pretty lucky, you know, sure. I really had major damages after a hurricane. But uh, January 3rd of this year, you know, right at the start of 2021, uh, our house burned down. And so uh, I, I, I talk about that a lot in, in, in the classes that I teach. And it's like, you think you know what it's like to experience something as catastrophic as that, uh, but you really don't. You don't know it until you experience it. Right. And so uh, I've taken that life lesson and it's made me be a better uh, teacher. Um, it has shown me that we've got a lot of work to do in this industry uh, because I really expected 
the adjuster who showed up at my house to be this model adjuster who's well, I was going to learn from this this gentleman and the right way of doing things and handling a large losses, you know, uh, this large fire event. And I will tell you, I was grossly disappointed. You know, somebody who told me he's been doing this for 20 years, you know, stepped foot in my house in, in five minutes, told me that he's going to be cleaning walls and, and salvaging wood floors. And I was just so taken aback by you haven't even done a full scope of my entire property. And you're already trying to get me to agree to a lesser scope. That's not going to put me and my family to pre-loss condition. It was very disheartening. And so, you know, just because you've been doing it a long time, doesn't make you a great adjuster, you know? True. So, yeah, yeah. A lot of, yeah. A lot of lessons were learned uh, in that experience. So for sure. Yeah. And that's, I mean, having been an adjuster for as long as I have, I've, I've dealt with a lot of like large loss and total loss and stuff like that. And it's the, the, the number one key, I think for those in my experience is to just listen. I would, I, you know, we can put together the report and to come back, you know, a few days later or whatever, and sit down at, you know, at a, at a table at your, wherever you're staying, you know, your executive housing or your hotel or whatever, and go through all the numbers and everything and kind of go from there. And, and hopefully your contractor is there when we do the initial inspection, 100%. But I'm not going to start like spouting off things I can't pay for like five minutes into it. I mean, that's it, on any claim, literally on, any, I don't think it's a water spot on the ceiling, section of fence blown down. We're going to scope it. We're going to get all the questions answered. We're going to let the person rant for a little bit. We're going to, you know, look around just a little bit and make sure that there aren't any other associated, you know, damages, like maybe some shingles blown off the roof or whatever. And then, you know, then we'll kind of move into the next step. We, I, the key thing, you know, and one of the things I think that people, if they haven't done a lot of denials or total loss claims, like complex, you know, claims that aren't super simple, like hail claims, right? Yeah. That they, they, and it wasn't really until I started handling claims like that once I got some experience that I was able to start seeing that the homeowner, no matter what, wants to be sure that they they feel like they're getting fair treatment, right? They're getting a, a, I hear it all the time. I see it on, you know, customer service reviews. Adjuster made me feel like I, I was getting a fair shake. Adjuster, you know, went out of his way to investigate this loss, even though he wasn't able to pay for it. Um, we appreciated that, right? That's all they want, right? So when, when we show up and we start, you know, denying things out of the gate, you know, I've had to clean up claims. I mean, you probably, you know, you certain have experience with this clean up claims where the the initial adjuster on a what I ended up paying one hundred fifty thousand dollars on denied it in fifteen minutes, kind of a thing, uh, without doing a full investigation or full inspection. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. So, you know, yeah. And I think, you know, this kind of like kind of goes into the next thing I want to talk about here. And that is sort of, you know, from the, the perspective of an IA firm, you know, you're, you, sometimes in certain situations, you guys are kind of under the gun as far as, you know, you need to have people and you, you know, you, with Hurricane Ida, you guys were able to, to gather up and train 1400 and it still wasn't enough, right? right. Um, during the off season, I'm sure there's probably you have a little bit less pressure on you, but what are some of the challenges? What are some of the things that are kind of pain points for you as a firm when you're looking at an untested person, you know, you're, getting, you're looking at a resume and it may say seven years or it may say no years, two licenses. You know, if, if an adjuster wants to be fully prepared to step into this role, whether they're brand new or they're coming to you, you know, untested from somebody somewhere else, 
what are some of the things that they can, you know, kind of work on? I mean, we've got customer service, customer care, certainly, uh, but what are some of the other issues that you guys have? So, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the biggest challenge is convincing adjusters that the, this, this industry is so dynamic. It's, it's always changing. Yeah. You know, there's new technologies out there. And so how do you convince this adjuster who's always done it this way, whether it's the right way or the wrong way that, hey, you need to kind of come in and learn the basics and learn about the importance of the customer experience. Because for a long time, you know, we always thought, hey, the customer got their money. That, that made them happy. But whenever we talked to our insurers, whenever we surveyed them, you know, it was the journey leading up to that check that really resonated and mattered most to them. And so, like you mentioned, we want to make sure that we hold that customer's hand, we educate them, we set the right expectations, we do what we say, um, and we exceed their expectations. And, um, you know, I've always kind of talked about, you know, letting that customer know that you are there to do the best job for them to deliver, you know, the best service that you can provide them. Uh, The ultimate win is for a customer to be happy with the services that you provided them, even though you didn't pay them a red penny, Um, because that's how you know that you really did your job. Uh, And that, I had that, that aha moment uh, very early in in my career. I, I think I'd only been an adjuster in about three or four months and, you know, no one really taught me the importance of policy. Uh, you know, I was kind of winging it. My resources were on either side of me uh, as the desk adjuster. And so I was trying to do my best to navigate it. Um, and I remember this one customer calling in and kind of telling me that, you know, hey, you know, I've, I've got 10 feet of water that was in my home. My homeowner adjuster came out here and denied my claim. I don't have flood insurance, but you know, I was told I, I need to get a denial letter and my, my initial adjuster never provided me one. And, you know, I told that customer, I said, I'll be more than happy to provide you with a denial letter, but if you'd like, I'd like to, I'd like to kind of go back to your file and just make sure that we didn't miss an opportunity uh, to, to find coverage there. And I remember her being so excited, you know, Jeff, that would be amazing. You know, any money would be helpful. I've received nothing. And so I remember ordering that file poll and, and, and going through each page of Polaroid pictures. That's right. Myself. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I was so confident that I was going to find something. Uh, you know, she had a very low deductible. This is, you know, way before those hurricane deductibles. And you know, something would have would have been a big uh, a gift to her, you know. Sure. And so I remember looking at these photos and like a brand new house, you know, no mission shingles. Uh, you know, I saw that water line almost up to the soffit in, in Chalmette, Louisiana. And I remember walking my file over to my manager and said, please help me find something. And unfortunately, there's just no, you know, no evidence to support any sort of payment under her homeowners. And I remember calling her back and really dreading that phone call. And I said, you know, Ms. Anderson, I said, I'm sorry. You know, I've been going through your file for the past 45 minutes, just trying to find, you know, some sort of opening that could justify coverage. And, and I just told her, I said, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do. There's no, no funds that can be paid under your policy. And I just ready for her to, to kind of blast me. And she's like, Jeff, thank you. I knew you, you went above and beyond. I didn't expect you to do that for me, but I know you, you, you gave it your all. And I really appreciate that. So thank you. And I was so not ready for that type of response. Um, but I remember hanging up the phone with her and thanking her for being a customer. And I sat back and I'm like, that's my job. Every time I talk to a customer, I need to convey my willingness to, to work for them uh, and to deliver, you know, an amazing claims experience for them, um, even though their damages may or may not be covered. And so I want them to have that warm and fuzzy feeling each, each time that I, uh, I leave their property or I hang up the phone with them. So I, yeah. I think, you know, that's, Can you teach that? Uh, Is it in your DNA? I don't know. We do our best to teach it. I honestly, I I, I, I hear, I've heard it my entire career from the the very first week, my very first ever storm, um, you know, time management, personal organization, efficiency, customers, those things can't be taught. You either have it or you don't. I'm like, 
I didn't have those things. And I, I figured them out because I, I, I recognized that they were important, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about mindsets, right? So you, you have um, new people that um, are used to technology, right? They're, they're texting and they're messaging and they're emailing and everything else. And then you have, you know, veterans who may have you know, not know where the, the power button is on their laptop when they show up for training. Um, <laughs> talk a little bit about your challenges as far as, you know, those two different kinds of worlds coming together and, and learning something like insurance. Absolutely. Um, and our, we, I kind of see that um, in our training classes. There's always a mix of, you know, uh, veteran adjusters and brand new folks. So in, in training, you kind of have to find that balance. But the biggest challenge for our veterans is, is the embracing the new technologies, your, you know, your hover reports, you know, using uh, matter ports. I mean, these are things that create an efficiency and, and claim handling where, you know, a lot of claims can be handled at the desk. And then you've got our, you know, the older generation adjuster going, hey, we're, we're going to be obsolete. You know, we're being replaced. And my answer to that is, is that, you know, we're always going to have a need for field adjusters. In my opinion, you know, yes. whenever you've got a large carrier overnight, we could have 15, 20,000 claims. How are you going to get to everyone very quickly? Because every one of those customers doesn't want to wait more than four days to get their claim handled. And so the cycle time for an average field loss is going to be about 12 to 14 days on average. Um, if we can take some of those claims that were maybe identified as light to moderate and bring that to a desk adjuster, you know, you're reducing that claim cycle time down to probably four to five days, yeah, literally in half. And so we want to make sure that we, we get to all our lower customers very quickly and, you know, close our claims, get money in their hands very quickly. And so to do so, you've got to embrace change. You have to embrace the, the technology that's out there. Um, cause if we don't, you know, we get left behind. And so, uh, no, there's never going to be a, uh, a time where there won't be any, uh, field adjusters just by customers demand somebody to come up to their home and look at the things, um, uh, inside their house and, and outside. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, just convincing adjusters that, Hey, it's going to be some changes here, but embrace it because it's going to make you a, a bigger and better, uh, adjuster. So. Yeah. For sure, yeah, and I think uh, you know whether they're whether they're a millennial or a Gen Zer or whatever, and they you know they want to just be able to file a claim on their app and then get a check on just get paid straight into their checking account after they took a couple photos around, you know that may work for tree limb on fence, right? Right. Um, right. But I think for for most other claims, you know, especially anything bigger than that. You're going to want to you're going to want to have a person there who's able to, you know, I think ideally, and I think the carriers want this and for, for their, their ideal scenario is to have somebody who can answer the insurance questions, um, who's going to be responsible for that claim, who's going to be responsible for making a coverage decision, who is also going to be responsible for writing the estimate and negotiating with the contractor and talking to the contractor and making sure that all the issues that, that might come up on the contracting side are addressed. And, you know, the, the, we can pay for it through the policy or we can't, right? Um, that's still, there's, there's nothing that can take that away. I, even the photo and scope thing, you know, the, the app-based, you know, jobs, those are probably not going to be like a fire in somebody's kitchen. Um, they're probably not going to be big hail claims, although I've, I've done some hail claims and they, you know, it, it creates more science. work on the back end, right? It, I mean, it, because Great. it's, it's, it opens for a reinspection. It gets denied from a, from a desk adjuster with okay, you know, okay to fair to maybe bad photos. Then it just drags the process out and it costs everybody money and time, right? So it, having somebody, a trained adjuster, I think, and you, you know, you, you're, I, I feel like you agree. I mean, that's kind of the ideal. So, you know, what kind of in, incentives, um, can we come up with to encourage people to get the kind of training that will make them a standalone adjuster, or some, an adjuster that is able to make those coverage decisions, uh, you know, negotiate with a contractor and have like 
world-class white glove bedside service or bedside manner with the, the, uh, the homeowner. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, how to, you know, first off, we start off with how do we talk to an insured? And it all starts with making a good first impression. Um, one of the things that I experienced whenever I got my phone call from my adjuster was, hey, Mr. Conrad, how are you doing today? Well, first off, you asked me a question that you probably should already know the answer to. Uh, my house just burned down and I'm not having a good day. You know, mm -hmm. so that was like a, my first turn off. You know, a better question is, is that, hey, Mr. Conrad, are you OK? Is your family OK? You know, I think that is a better question to ask. Uh, but, you know, listening to the customer, not talking over them, you know, it can really kind of set the tone of how the rest of that claim is going to proceed. Yeah. Um, and reassuring them uh, that, hey, I'm here to help. I'm here to you know, find coverage. The customer just kind of relaxes and just starts working with you. Yeah. Um, and I'll just, so yeah, just let me I, jump in talk. there real quick. You know, Absolutely. I think there's there's a, a adjuster needs to learn, learn to read the room um, because I, I've sat in trainings before where they'll you know we're going to practice some customer customer interactions. We're talking on the phone, making first contacts and stuff, and the uh, people you know students in the classroom and then t the instructor or the teacher or whoever didn't really like you know s make any comments about this, but but it would be like you know. Everybody's got a little loss report that they look at and, oh, well, it looks like the toilet overflowed in the bathroom in the basement, you know, the half, half finished basement. And so we start these little like mock, you know, pretend contact call things. Hello, Mr. Johnson. I am Matt from your insurance company. First, are you and your family okay? It's like the toilet overflowed in the basement while we were right. out of town. I think we're fine, right? right? So it's like on a hail claim. You're not like going, you know, so you, they got to be able to read the room, right? Of course. Yeah. I, you know, asking them if they're okay after a toilet overflow. I mean, probably Stretch Armstrong is, there. got stuff down there before we left town and, you know, <laughs> Stretch is not okay, but uh, we're fine. Or just, you know, hey, I'm sorry this happened, but I'm not going to ask you how your day's going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, but yeah, definitely, you, you know, it's use common sense whenever we're talking to, um, but yeah, just you know, be a person first, you know, don't just go right into, Hey, you know, I'm an adjuster. This is how it's, you know, I think customers want to see you be a person um, than just yeah. a robot. who's just there to just do a job. I think, you know, that's, that's really where I was kind of going with that. Um, but, you know, moving on to the, the contractor aspect of that is, you know, we want to make sure that we as an adjuster kind of let the contractor know, hey, this is what's needed. Okay, this is the evidence that I need in order to support these, you know, scope changes or off pricing, you know. So it's a lot of times we want, if we're not clear with what I need from an adjuster standpoint to get it approved and get this file closed, then we're just battling back and forth. We're arguing. And a lot of times if we're not clear, then the and the contractor is just pounding their fist going, where's, where's my money? Where's my money? It's, well, did we let the contractor know what is needed in order for them to get their money? You know, if right. we set that expectation and the contractor doesn't meet it, then that's on the contractor. But a lot of times we're just arguing, you know, without, hey, this is what I need. If you want this to be paid, hey, send me the damage photo showing the, the damage is missed. Show me your, you know, the receipt of, but the material, whatever, whatever's needed. It, as long as we get that, hey, it should make everyone's job easy. We don't want to work against contractors. Our ultimate goal is to get our customer taken care of. Yeah. You know, as long as you know, we're not paying for any upgrades, that there's no coverage for that. But right, right. There's a there's this a little like um I don't even know what you'd want to call it, but it's like a saying or a question that that I've heard again this since the very first time I started doing claims. And I hear people say, and I see it on social media every now and then. So do you adjust for the, the insured or do you adjust for the carrier? And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense because let's, let's take an example, right? So um, one whole run of fence blows down. Like, what does that look like for me to adjust for the insured versus adjusting for the carrier? It's the policy is going to tell me what I can't, can and can't pay for. I'm going to, based on my experience and maybe standing there with the fencing guy, we're going to say, well, it's in order to get them to pre-loss condition, it's going to be 
exactly this amount of money. Where does that question of for the insured or for the carrier? I don't know if you hear that on the training side much. I mean, does that come up? So and here's here's how I address that in class, because that, that question does come up and not really, you know, are you for the insured or the carrier is I'm always doing what's best for the customer um, because that should also be what's good for the carrier. Yeah. You know, we, we owe for the repair option first, replace second. So if, if, if I believe and as an adjuster that I can do the repair, then I'm going to explain to the customer, Hey, we can put you to pre-loss by doing a repair. Uh, if it comes to find out that it cannot be repaired, Hey, we're going to do the replace option here. But you know, you're going to understand that I'm, you know, I'm doing what's best for you and, and, and just letting them know. So, but it's, if I pull, you know, 20 adjusters into a room and I give them a, a damage scenario, each one of them is probably going to estimate that loss differently. It's not because they're doing it for the carrier or for the insurer. It's just, they believe based off of their expertise that we can get this customer to pre-loss by doing X, Y, and Z. And as long as you, you know, justify that in your documentation and your photos, you know, that's really all we're asking an adjuster to do. And once we go the repair option and we find out that there's more, you know, evidence to support, hey, this cannot be repaired. Hey, let's pursue the the, the, the replace option here. Sure. And having that conversation with the insured really kind of says, okay, I get it. Let's try to repair it. If not, we're going to replace it. But we need the evidence to support the replace option. Right. So as long as I take all my photographs and I got everything documented and it makes sense, then I should be able to replace it just fine because I've explained that it cannot be repaired because of X, Y, and Z. So if we do the legwork, you know, I'm always estimating for my customer. Sure. So absolutely. So yeah. Teach it. And um, just to clarify for, you know, for people who are, you know, listening, um, we're not saying if you look at a fence, and like it's a chain link fence and the top bar is bent and it's the things are busted off at the base and the concrete's pulled out and everything that we're all oh, we're going to try and repair that because that's what we're supposed to do first right. if you're standing there and it's like everything's broken you can't i mean you could glue it that's back together obvious. maybe that's not going to be an option right so we're saying if it looks like hey maybe on a deck we've got some uh you know some inch three quarter hail hit the deck and it's unstained right or even if it's painted or whatever and there's some little like you can see like some fuzzy spots where the or some maybe almost chips where the hail hit it let's pressure wash that thing repaint it restain it if you can still see right gouges right. if it's deep enough to where it's like it really got into the, then we'll talk about like replacing stuff right but that's a that's a perfectly so, legitimate repair option same thing with like ac condenser units and things like that um but guy grand and i um actually had a big conversation about this and you know, some guys, some adjusters, guys and gals, they are, you know, in a previous life, they were a contractor, right? And maybe, or maybe they were a handyman um, and they were like, well, I mean, sh shoot, I just know, you know, th they go out on a claim and they're like, well, I know that, that uh, you could just take some sandpaper and, you know, squirt some Windex on it and it'd be just as good as new. And that's probably what the insurance is going to do. So that's what I'm going to pay for. We don't know, <laughs> handyman, this is what I think they're going to do. We owe them what, if a contractor came out and said, I'm going to fix that, what's the customary and reasonable, appropriate repair or replace for whatever it is, right? So right. Um, that's something I think we fight against a little bit as well. You know, when, you, when you're doing the reinspections and the homeowner's upset because, you know, the guy, you know, the contractor saying we need to replace it and the guy wrote an estimate to just like, you know, clean it. Yeah, clean it, you know, spit on it, and wipe it off with your elbow or, you know, and we we don't owe what we think they're going to do. We owe what, you know, they should do. Because I think on from the carrier's perspective, it can come back to, come back on them if you know, if we didn't if they didn't write for the appropriate replace or, you know, for whatever restoration function it is. Yeah, uh, and, and and really going back to my personal experience, uh, you know, I'll, that's kind of how I treated my adjuster. I didn't want to have to do it, but when he told me he was going, and we're standing literally the, the fire occurred in the attic and we're looking, we're right under the room where the fire started and he's looking at my drywall going, oh, we can definitely clean this. And I really thought he was kidding, you know, and the, the, the water hoses. <laughs> hey, there, said, everybody. 
we're standing, we're standing in water. And I, I was like, this is not going to put me in a pre-loss condition. Uh, I don't know where you're, you feel that, that that's going to be acceptable to me. Uh, I said, you owe for pre-loss condition. I said, are you going to be held liable for you not estimating this correctly? Because if you clean these walls, I've got smoke and soot in, in between my studs here. Yeah. You cleaning a wall is not going to make my family safe. I said, are you going to be responsible for that? I don't think so. So yeah. do the right thing. And, you know, I, I don't know, it doesn't, it takes a lot for me to get very angry. And I got angry. Uh, my wife looked at me like, oh my God, the contractor looked at me like, I've never seen this side of you either. Cause I didn't have a contractor president. And he was just kind of baffled too, that this was acceptable and it just yeah. it was not. So, but yeah. It gives a bad I name. that happened. Yeah. But in it, the it, industry when so. that, when that kind of thing happens, unfortunately. Um, and it's, there's a lot of it out there and, you know, I think, you know, you're of the same mind as I am is we have to find a way to like, you know, sort of standardize how people are trained or at least the things that they're trained, the things that they go out in the field with. And it's not just, you know, we could talk about technical skills, certainly, you know, what are the, the, the things that it, adjusters need to show up with as far as like understanding computers, software, um, the equipment that they use. Um, but if they don't have that second half, which I think I would even call that like the other three quarters, right? The technical is 25% of it. And then the other three quarters is the, the policy knowledge, the customer care knowledge, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, as far as like, you know, to shift gears slightly, um, when, when, and I know you're not in recruiting or like, you know, on the HR side, but you know, if, if somebody's showing up to a Crawford training, um, is there, is there any benefit for, for a, a new adjuster to, you know, try and go get like an Xactimate level two certification before he or she shows up or some, whether they get the certification or not to get, to get their hands on that stuff before they show up to you, where you're going to probably teach them try to teach them a lot of that stuff as well. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. Sure. You know, you know, obviously, you know, that, that estimating tool Xactimate is, is very important to kind of know and be familiar with. So, um, you know, carriers are, are now kind of looking for those certifications. If we have a small, you know, event somewhere, they're going to say, hey, send all my level two Xactimate, you know, certified folks. So they're going to be at the top of the really? list. So think of yourself as an adjuster, your, 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 your business for self. And I'm going to make sure that I get all of my, you know, licenses, uh, all of my certifications, because I want to be at the top of that list. And so investing in yourself is going and investing into training is only going to make you more popular in this industry. Um, so investing in yourself allows us to invest in, in the adjuster and, and it will pay dividends because uh, we're going to do our best. If you're really good and you've got all those certifications and licenses, you're only securing your longevity. Um, and with our carriers that we have, uh, we can provide that type of opportunity. 
Uh, unfortunately, you know, some folks wait for a big event and they're not prepared. They haven't invested in themselves. They haven't received any certifications and they feel, hey, I can go in to Ida and make a lot of money. And really, right. they don't because they're struggling to learn at a time where this is an event is really not time to learn. You should have already kind of prepared, you know, when Mother Nature was quiet to, to really be ready to go whenever uh, she wakes back up. For sure. So in other words, they they really need to treat this like a business. I mean, if you were, you know, we say this sometimes, you know, if, if you're, <laughs> if you want to be a surgeon, you know, you're not learning on the job. You're not, you know, you're, you, you've got to go. Not my surgeon. <laughs> yeah. So you are not learning on me anyway. Um, but so let me ask you a question though. It does, is, is your training at Crawford? Is that like kind of generic adjuster trainings or do you have like, is it like, when you onboard somebody, you're like, okay, well, we're going to put you through this particular carrier's certification. And it includes teaching you some exactimate stuff, some scoping stuff, some this, some that, but also training to like a set of estimating guidelines. So we've got a kind of like an entry level uh, five day class, uh, which okay. is your policy, customer experience, file documentation, and three days of scenario based exactimate. And we kind of focus on the level two uh, Xactimate certification. So we've actually had some folks, or a lot of folks, believe it or not, that have never touched Xactimate before, came through our five-day class, and they're testing for that Xactimate level two and getting it. Um, it and we, we prepare for that exam. Um, but we also have a separate three-day uh, level two Xactimate uh, prep course, um, preparing the, uh, the adjuster for that level two. Um, and then we also have our carrier certifications. Uh, we've got three different carriers that, you know, whether or not they require a certification or not, we, we want to build uh, a familiarity with the carrier's uh, claim file system, uh, their specific processes, any specific uh, estimating tools that they use. We want to create that familiarity so that you're not seeing it for the first time uh, whenever you get deployed. And so we, we, we add that to their Renovo profile, which is our, our kind of like our adjuster, you know, profile. Mm -hmm. We ask that all of our adjusters, you know, once they're loaded into Renovo, hey, update your, your licenses, update your certifications. And there's a toggle on that, that web page or that app on your phone that, hey, I'm ready to work. Because whenever we have a carrier that says, hey, I need 50 adjusters, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to query my 50 adjusters that are ready to work that have all of these uh, accreditations and certifications. Again, they're going to be at the top of the list. Um, so definitely, you know, making sure that your profile is up to date will definitely keep you working. Um, so that's the key to sure. success in this industry. If you want to work, just make sure that we know you want to work because we're going to put you to work. Yeah, so. yeah. Treat it like a business for sure, and and you know, don't rely on the guy that's hiring you to <laughs> to teach you how to do everything. You know, it's 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 imperative. And, and it's kind of like just kind of circle back slightly on, on the whole, like, well, I can go on hurricane Ida and make a bunch of money. The people that make a bunch of money on hurricane Ida are the people who know how to be super efficient and keep their claims closed. Cause you're not going to get paid on a claim until that sucker's closed and they turn the invoice in. It's not going to happen. You know, so if you're they're... flailing around and you're trying to learn and you're trying to, well, I'm just going to go out there and scope for, you know, 10 days, and I'll get them all scoped because yeah, my phone's ringing and my manager's telling me to do it and da, 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 my buddy's telling me to do it. And then I'll just sit in a hotel room or I've heard, I've seen guys, I know guys have done this. I'll go home and write them up and I'll just be in the comfort of my own home. That has got That's to be for disaster. Absolutely disaster. How are you going to, if you get new claims assigned to you, how, how are you going to do them? You got to go back and try and find a hotel again. I mean, it's like, I don't know. It's, that's a, there's a, whole there's other a misnomer situation. out there. Yeah. There's a misnomer out there. Hey, I've got my justice license. Who's, who's hiring? What? You're right. <laughs> How about who's training? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so getting, you, you only got a, you only got a small piece of the, the puzzle needed to be successful in this industry. So uh, yeah. we want to continue to provide those opportunities to, to learn the rest of what's needed to be really successful here. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, on top of that, you know, I, I hear stories um, about people showing up, and you may have told me one of these stories that people showing up without gear 
or showing up, you know, like riding along with their buddy and thinking that they're going to like work together, you know, to these big events. I mean, it's like, they just don't, I don't understand how they don't, don't know, you know, we do our but best at TV to, to put information out about this stuff to get it. But I guess not everybody finds it. We, we, we're, uh, we're fighting that good battle, Matt. We're yeah. fighting that together. You know, we want to set people up for success. And we don't, I don't want to see anybody give up a regular job to come in to this industry and just get ruined. I've, I've seen sure. it happen so many times. And it's, it's, it's something that I'm just, you know, I want to prevent. You know, yeah. I want to make sure that these folks are, are educated and ready to go. And because if you show up unprepared, you're, you're making that insured really uh, unhappy because they paid all this money for this, this insurance product that they hope they've never had to use. And the one time they have to use it, it's just an absolute disaster and they move on. And we want to, we want to protect that, the customer. We want to protect the, the adjuster too. I don't want you to lose money, you know? So uh, yeah. it's, a, exactly. it's an exhausting labor of love for us. Right, Matt? <laughs> it really is. It really is. Ready. Um, so, so let's kind of we'll kind of button this whole thing up and you i think i feel like you sort of hit on it a little bit earlier but uh you know when we're talking about the future of claims handling kind of in your view and your experience and, and what you know you know what does that look like you know and, and is, is is it possible that some technology could come along uh like maybe like a robot from boston dynamics that will handle claims instead of people you know, with uh, with cameras these days, I mean, with, you know, I guess with the Apple, with the LiDAR camera, you know, I can just send a, an invitation to a customer to pretty much scan their room and I've gotten everything that I need as far as measurements and photographs that I wouldn't necessarily have to send anyone out there. Um, I, 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 I think we're kind of moving toward that, but it's all going to come down to customer expectations. I want somebody here. I, and I think for your larger losses, we're always going to have a need for field adjusters. I think the field adjusters are going to have amazing tools and, and embracing technology to make that, their jobs a lot easier and more efficient uh, too. And it's just going to make us better. Uh, and I think it's, it's, I don't think we'll ever be replaced by robots, um, but who's, who knows? Um, Knock on wood. But I think we're a good ways <laughs> away from that. But I, I I'm, I've, I've always embraced technology because I feel like if I don't, then I'm left behind. And so uh, we got to keep moving it, you know, and it, I think sure. it makes it more fun for us to, to be better. Yep. Yep. For sure. Well, excellent. So if people want more information about Crawford and how, and onboarding and, and more specifically about Crawford uh, training, uh, where can they go? Absolutely. Uh, www.croco.com forward slash cat. And then once you go to that page, you can apply to our, uh, our open adjuster position. And uh, there's a training button there. You can click on the training tab and sign up for uh, some of our, cor our courses. So, but yeah, we look Very forward good. to seeing you in our classes and, and putting you to work. Awesome. Awesome. And then you guys have a catastrophe conference coming up, right? That's right. So in uh, February of 2022, um, we've got our Crawford CatCon. So it will be on February 27th through March 4th. Uh, so it'll be in Orlando, Florida. So that's kind of where I am right now. Uh, we're actually meeting to kind of finalize our plans here and, and uh, making sure that that event is going to be a fantastic one for all. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um... We'll get the, the word out about that stuff for sure. And, and Jeffrey, thank you so much for being on here. And, and I just want to wish you and your family a Merry Christmas. 2021 was pretty rough. So I'm ready for, I'm ready for 2022. But it was Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I feel like I said the same thing going into 2021. And I was like, man, I was so glad that's behind us. But 22 I, is just a kind of so was wanna, just a continuation. Yeah, I don't want to say anything because it's like, who knows what can happen. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed what you do and a uh, big fan of yours. And uh, again, uh, thank you for everything that you do. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.